e ngā mana e ngā reo e ngā karangatanga maha koutou kua waihape mai ki oku nei papa, nau mai, hara mai, tauti mai rā. A tēnei rā te tuake, he māngai mo te haukāinga o ngai tua huriri ki te tuku i te reo rāhiri ki o koutou. O tira ki tō tātou nei maraikura e noho ake nei, nō reira e Helen, nau mai, tauti mai ki Waenganui a mātou i tēnei o ngā pō. Kā reo e tōro e ngā kōrero, hio i tēnei rā te mihi atu ki a koutou katoa, me te mana koia ka puta he hua i tō tātou nei noho tahi, tō tātou nei wānanga tahi i tēnei o ngā pō. Nō reira, tēnā rā koutou katoa. Ka tahuri au ki te reo pākea, mo te wāpoto ki te whakamārama atu, hio i tēnei au e whakamānau atu nei ki a koutou katoa. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Corbin Teaika, and I've come along tonight on behalf of Ngai Tua Huriri, the local hapu and rūnanga within the area, to welcome Helen first and foremost, but also to acknowledge each and every one of you that have come along tonight. Undoubtedly, there's going to be a lot of fruits that come out of the discussions tonight, and climate change in particular is something that is going to affect uh, Ngai Tahu and our communities quite significantly. Most of our burial sites, most of our current urupa and cemeteries are all on the coastline. Uh, and so it's something that, uh, as a tribe, we have been talking about uh, and preparing for for some time. And so uh, I know wearing my uh, runanga hat, I'm very looking forward to, very much looking forward to uh, some of the conversations and some of the insights, particularly from an international uh, perspective as well. Uh, my job tonight is simply to welcome uh, Helen uh, to our rohe, but also to kick things off with a karakia before passing over uh, to our mia. Uh, so on that note, uh, kia karakia tato. We have a quick karakia. A tokona te rangi e tū nei, whakatika tika te tū ara anu i opa ai a kuru a tipu a kuru a tahi toka tokona e tāne, ko toko maunga rangi hikitia rangi hapa ai nga e tū, ko te rangi e tū nei, me te papa e tā koto nei, tū mau mai te rā e tū nei. I a tama i wahu i a tama o kotahi i te putanga a tama i te rangi tā more more nui, te putanga a tama i te rangi tū hā hā, he kei hui a rangi e tū nei. Fiti fiti nuku, fiti fiti rangi, fiti fiti papa, fiti fiti tau. Tū te māhora nui, tū te māhora roa, tū te māhora nui a te tū nei. Tā whia kia re hua kia tama i waho hau mie, hui e, tā e ki e. Tō reira tēnā koutou katoa. E na mana, e na reo, e rau rangatira mā, tēnei te mihi kia koutou, i te kaupapuro te rā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā tato katoa. Uh, it is very important for us as a city uh, that uh, we stand alongside each other, Te Hono Nā Council and uh, Ngai Tuhuriri, uh, the partnership that we have developed over years and the relationship that we have established means that we stand together to greet and welcome our visitors uh, to this place, but also to greet all of you and welcome you to this important part of the Christchurch Conversations programme. This is a series of um, public talks that bring us together to hear from inspiring speakers and to explore ideas about our city's future. Christchurch Conversations are presented by Christchurch City Council in association with Te Pūtahi, uh, Christchurch Centre for Architecture and City Making. Tonight's event, a Christchurch Conversation with the Right Honourable Helen Clark, Leadership and Action in the face of change is presented in association with the University of Canterbury and Christchurch NZ. And we're very fortunate to be here this evening in this fantastic venue, which now has a proper sound system. Uh, so it has an acoustic value to it that it didn't have uh, before the, the disaster. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome my former colleague, former Prime Minister, uh, the Right Honourable Helen Clark, to Ōtotahi Christchurch for this very, very timely conversation. I'm sure this won't be the only time that you come back uh, to um, speak with us and share your insights with us. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight and so generously providing your time. Our facilitator, Dr Bronwyn Hayward, will provide a more in-depth introduction and outline how this evening's conversation will run. Uh, Bronwyn is an Associate Professor in Political Science at the University of Canterbury. Her research focuses on the intersection of sustainable development, youth, climate change and citizenship. Uh, 
coordinating lead author for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. She was a lead author for the 2018 special report on sustainable development and poverty eradication. These things go hand in hand. We are so lucky to have someone like Bronwyn who is able to help us uh, develop and lead the conversation tonight. Nō reira e te manu ko tu tūrangi, nō mai tōtimai ki ototahi, mō te wā. Nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā ratato katoa. Tēnā koe, Leanne. Um, ka mihi mahana ki a koutou. A salam. Uh, a warm southern greetings. Uh, it's my privilege to be speaking tonight to the Right Honourable Helen Clark. Many of us know her well as a three-term former New Zealand Prime Minister. Um, but if you've read her recent book, you'd realise that that was really only the start of a global <laughs> career. Uh, for the last, since 2009, for two terms, she's been head of the United Nations Development Programme. UNEP sits at the apex of the UN. It's the biggest and busiest arm of the organisation. At the time Helen stepped down in 2017, it had a working budget of $4.9 billion, spent on uh, on-the-ground staff of over 17,000, conducting 4,500 aid projects in 170 countries. Two-thirds of that was spent on climate issues, but it ranged from development and democracy through to um, cook stoves and local community engagement. It's also a testament to Helen's astonishing management skills that under her leadership, she's been able to bring that sprawling organisation to the top of the scale for the first time ever. It, became, uh, it ranked highest in international transparency. So tonight we're talking about uh, climate change and particularly leadership in this context of a changing environment, of sustainable development, and Helen's experience, and what it means, what we can take from it for our city. So I'd like to kick off. We're going to hear some questions later from some of Christchurch's youngest leaders, who are filling up these seats in, uh, shortly. But I first want to ask you, Helen, about sustainable development. Mm -hmm. It's a term that we talk about, but a lot of people aren't clear about what it's about. If they know yeah. anything about it, it seems to be something we do somewhere else. Yeah. So why is it so important for you that you're launching these conversations? What does sustainable development mean for you? And, and what do you think, why is it important that New Zealand starts this conversation about sustainable development and the goals? Well, firstly, thank you, Bronwyn. Uh, thank you, Mayor Leanne. Thank you, uh, representative of local hapu. And thank you, everyone, for coming uh, tonight. Uh, I am having a number of conversations about sustainable development uh, while I'm home over the northern summer when things go a, a little quiet with uh, global, global events. But for me, the working definition of sustainable development has always been that one that came from Gro Harlem Brundtland's seminal uh, sustainable development uh, report going back now about three decades. And it was about ensuring that we have a sustainable legacy for future uh, generations, that we don't uh, overexhaust uh, what our planet uh, offers us. Uh, but the environmental component of it is one component. Sustainable development has always had three components, the social and the economic. And it's very important to look holistically uh, across the three uh, dimensions. Now, the UN has had a history of development agendas, but generally when th people think about development, they think, oh, that's those countries over there, not countries like mine, you know, we're a developed country. Well, actually, uh, we have moved on from agendas, global agendas, that are about what developing countries should do, and we've moved to this agenda, which is universal, and says, actually, there is work to do across sustainable development in every country on Earth. And of course, that includes our own. So you have these 17 goals, which, which in my opinion has always been too many, but that's what it is. Uh, you could cluster them into fewer and have fewer targets, but the, the agenda is right, the direction is, is right. And it runs all the way across poverty and hunger and education and health and gender equality, inequalities in 
in general, uh, right through uh, economic goals, energy transformation goals, to what we might call conservation and climate action uh, goals. And with just that headline list, you can see that if in New Zealand we began to report against those things, we would immediately see quite a range of issues and, and problems that, yeah. that we would have to face up to. Now, you know, in many ways, if you look at the overall uh, direction and composition of the government agenda, it's tackling many of these things. But one thing I would advocate with my old UN hat on is that New Zealand needs an explicit SDG strategy, actually. M most developing countries have them. A number of developed countries have them. And it is hard to report against SDGs, as New Zealand went and did at, at the UN in July, if you don't actually have a strategy and then set out to deliberately uh, measure uh, your progress against that. Uh, with my hat on as patron of the Commonwealth's local government forum, I also advocate that cities and district councils take up the SDGs as, as an agenda. And again, many have around the world. Well, mm. that was what I was going to ask you next. So mm. Christchurch mm. has been criticised uh, in its for its rebuild, for missing opportunities for sustainable development. But we've got time and we've got mm. this opportunity. So for a city like Christchurch, there's 17 goals, mm. <laughs> but what are the leverage points or the things that you would prioritise in communities like this from what you've seen elsewhere that would make a difference if we were developing a sustainable development agenda for us? Well, I don't want to speak no, know, for Christchurch. Perhaps I, I, take I, other I cities. want to recognise that Christchurch has long had a reputation as being a very progressive yeah. city and, of course, a very resilient city, which has been through the most extraordinary shocks. Uh, the earthquake of 2011 was just so devastating, and you know, the consequences are still felt and will be felt for a long time uh, by, by people here. And then the the very shocking uh, events of the, the murders at the, at the mosques, uh, which you know, the, the news on that ricocheted around the world. If we ask ourselves, where were we when it happened? I was in Azerbaijan, actually at a conference involving a number of former heads of government with two other former Kiwi PMs there as well. I mean, everyone was, was oh, in shock. Was it the kids' so, climate? Sorry. Yeah, a, a very, very... Um, you know, mm. Well, let's just say everybody's hearts go out to, to Christchurch and, and trying to you know, recover from, from both of these terrible events. So, you know, where, where would I most emphasise? I think, uh, firstly, the tone the city has on inclusion is incredibly important. Uh, inclusion of all who live within it, uh, all ethnicities, uh, respect for indigenous people and culture, inclusion of, of disability, uh, gender equality, uh, rainbow community fully included. This, this is incredibly important for social cohesion. Uh, I also uh, recognize that Christchurch has its, its problems of deep poverty and marginalization. And that is not good you know, for, for social health either. So an emphasis on, on that. Uh, I think there are uh, big opportunities in the sustainability sphere, and, and Christchurch, of course, has, has good strategies. You're, you're a city that's made for biking, right? <laughs> um, and uh, I just retweeted from a friend in uh, the Netherlands uh, who reported in her tweet that the city of Utrecht there has just built the, the largest bicycle park in the world. Well, you know, maybe Christchurch could have <laughs> the largest bicycle park in the world, uh, you know, really, really emphasising that. So, no, I, I think there are a lot of opportunities here, and this is a community which will, it does pick up progressive yep. ideas and run with them. And so I experiment. feel confident you could do mm. it. Mm. So can I ask you something personal? Um, where did this interest in the environment come from? You grew up on a farm with four sisters. Did it start there or did the passion really come later? I did grow up on a farm and I grew up on a farm which bordered what was then a forest park, a Pirongia Forest Park, west of Hamilton, now a conservation park. And what was very clear uh, from my childhood, and of course a long time before, was that the New Zealand bush was largely a silent bush. Uh, because the damage of rats, stoats, wild cats 
to our native uh, birds was has been so devastating in, in so many parts of the, the country. So, yes, you would hear the tui and the bellbird and the fantail and the, mm. and the white eye, which were high up, uh, but the ground birds were gone and a lot of and the songbird uh, population was depleted. I never saw a kereru, a native pigeon, uh, in, the, in the bush, and yet it would have been there historically. So that was really my first awareness of the damage that uh, the predators had done. And then, of course, you had the, the wild pig, the Captain Cookers, that came uh, with the first uh, European sailing boats. Uh, and you had the goats, and they did terrific damage to the undergrowth. So that contributes to degraded forests. So it really goes back to my childhood and many bushwalks with my, my father that brought that early awareness. So I was very excited when I first became a minister in 1987. That one of my two jobs was to be Minister of Conservation. And for those of you with long memories, you may recall that Eugenie Sage was my press secretary <laughs> when I was Minister of Conservation. She was a wonderful and passionate press secretary, and I'm full of admiration for her as Minister of Conservation now. So you've talked before about how New Zealand elections are won and lost in the middle ground. If we're going to, st when we look at how people talk about the environment, particularly in the US, I mean, at the moment, let's hope it's an outlier, but we see this growing, deepening polarisation. So from your experience in the rural um, uh, Hamilton areas mm. and thinking about farming, how do we bridge what feels like a growing divide between rural and urban communities? Do you think there is a risk that that divide will get deeper here or is it something we can more easily bridge than the states? Well, I think it is an issue. Uh, when I was a, a child, uh, you know, many, many New Zealanders were barely a generation removed from the land. Uh, but, but now a most, you know, the most significant proportion of the population clearly is, is uh, heavily urbanised. And so, uh, yeah, the, there is a lot of New Zealand that has very little experience of, of, of rural New Zealand and the pressures that, it, that it's under. Uh, and it's had its, you know, its, its huge economic mm. uh, ups and downs, and I you know, saw the impact of that on my own family's farming operations over, over the years. Uh, but I think also our farming community is now under pressure uh, because we need to show as a country that we have sustainable agriculture. And that wasn't what motivated uh, the development. Mm. Of, of New Zealand farming, we, we basically came in and we, we cut down everything <laughs> that stood in the way of, of, uh, of planting grass and we, we stocked as heavily as we could. Uh, and we had, uh, I guess, a commodity orientation. And the longer term result of that has been uh, quite an impact uh, on uh, the environment, not least on our, on our water and on our greenhouse gas uh, emissions, 50% uh, of which come from our agriculture. And yet, you know, we, we have relied, even in the modern economy, on the farming community to carry you know, a lot of the burden of producing GDP. So I think it's incredibly important to be working closely uh, with the farming community and its representatives on uh, an orientation to sustainable farming so that we have a, a story to take to the world that, that we really do care uh, about these issues. And that's going to be critical to the, to the future of our exporting. You know, will we command high value markets uh, if we get branded as a, as a polluting producer? Uh, I think it also will, will force a focus on, on value over volume, how do we get greater value out of what we do, how we, how we process uh, the finished product. Uh, we still export a lot of commodity off our, off our farming, and, and ideally that needs to, to change to much more branded product, produce. But I, I think it's important and to underline work with the rural communities. There's always been champions of sustainable farming. I knew them in my time in, in government and, and in opposition, and, and their voices are important. Yeah. Um, 
can we talk a wee bit more about what, what we can do as a, first as a government, then maybe as a city for climate change? In an interview with Simon Wilson in the Herald last year, you used very strong language. You described mm. the climate situation as almost apocalyptic. Mm. Um, in retrospect, when you look back at our opportunities that we may have missed, I mean, was it an impossible task to try and bring in a methane tax when you first tried? Well, it was tough. I mean, initially, uh, when we were in government, we thought a carbon tax would be the most, the quickest and most effective way of, um, of drawing attention to the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but that ran into incredible resistance. So instead, we went for the emissions trading scheme and uh, had set a date for agriculture to come in. I mean, it's unthinkable really for New Zealand to try emissions trading without covering agriculture because it uh, covers uh, half, half the emissions. Uh, but that then got you know, delayed almost to the point of absurdity. And now with the new strategy again, it, it's, uh, it's back on the, the table. But look, I'm, I'm not uh, pessimistic about New Zealand's um, potential to get to zero carbon. Uh, I think it is possible, as I say, work, work with the farming community on the particular issues that, that, that they have with the, the methane and the nitrous, nitrous oxygen uh, oxide emissions. Uh, but on the energy side, we have the potential to be 100% renewable. We're about 80% now. Now, the, the rest is made up of the thermal production off Huntley and a couple of other minor, uh, minor uh, uh, thermal uh, plants. But we could go a green hydrogen route, uh, for example, uh, by uh, using our sustainable energy to produce green hydrogen for the down periods, which could help cover uh, the gap that's, that's currently covered by uh, thermal. Uh, and of course, uh, we could do a lot more on energy efficiency, uh, on solar, on wind. We, we have huge potential. Uh, so and then converting that into the sustainable transport fleet, uh, into more encouragement of walking, walking and cycling. I think on the, on the rubbish side, you know, the zero waste to landfill, um, we could do it, reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, so you know, let's be very positive that New Zealand can have a successful climate action agenda, uh, both at the, uh, the, the nationwide level and, and also at the level of, you know, progressive cities like Christchurch. Well, on that, and thinking about what a progressive city could do, it can be really overwhelming um, when you think about the perilous situation we're in. Lack of international leaders, huge pressure on our climate, on our biodiversity, real risks of war. It, it gets quite overwhelming. But recently, I was working in Nepal for IPCC and visiting Lincoln, old Lincoln students who had been on the Hillary Exchange. I felt a bit like I was... Mm you know, stalking you because I just <laughs> followed along in the wake, uh, but in a different mm. area. Mm. Um, but what I was thinking was that there are really remarkable stories of local communities. A lot of those, mm. of the Lincoln students that had come out on the Hillary Exchange mm. after 25 years have done mm. amazing things. Mm. And I was thinking, mm. you must have seen a lot of problems, but also a lot of success stories really mm. against the odds for communities. Mm. Are there any that you that really stand out in your mind of little or big where you think where people have made a difference despite the situation? Uh, lit literally countless thousands yeah. of examples, and and one of the good things UNDP used to do was run uh, a major uh, award uh, system every two to three years, uh, which recognised indigenous and local communities for efforts made in, in conservation and, and climate action. And over the years, I saw so many communities, ethnic and local, uh, indigenous and local, come forward and, and be recognised, and you'd watch the little video about them. But I also got uh, to, to visit many initiatives uh, out in, in countries. And I, I'll give you one that comes immediately to mind. Uh, it was on the coast of Senegal where the mangroves had all been cleared away. Now, when the mangroves go, a habitat for fish and shellfish goes. Mm -hmm. And so that's a source of protein that's gone, and it's a source of, of livelihood for, for fishers and, uh, and people who, who collect and, and, and smoke and sell uh, shellfish. So this particular initiative, uh, which was UNDP 
uh, supported, funded through the Global Environment Facility, uh, had set about restoration of the mangroves. Now, I should underline the women did all the work. <laughs> I went uh, and saw the women at it, and they, they were in sort of waders, you know, way up uh, to the top of their, their thighs, and they were down there in the mud planting these mangroves. But already a lot had been done, and uh, they were getting livelihoods again off the fish that were coming back into the mangrove area and the, and the shellfish. Mm. And we saw the, the, the traders, little stall holders who were... Uh, you know, smoking and 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 selling the, uh, the the shellfish. So that that stood in my mind as really the, the the perfect sustainable development project because the mangroves were back. The mangroves are also a very important buffer mm. uh, for coastal uh, community resilience. Incredibly important. Uh, the fish were back. That was biodiversity, uh, and the the livelihoods were, were back. I mean, just sort of flip the coin. Another side of the mangrove story. Uh, after the horrific uh, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, I went and visited the city of Tacloban, which had been uh, one of the very worst affected. And Tacloban had uh, quite a big sort of harbour, and the airport was out on one arm of it. And that harbour used to be full of mangroves. Mm. But over the years, you know, people wanted easier access for their boats to the, the little jetties and the mangroves had all been taken out. So what happens when Typhoon Haiyan uh, hits? It just whistles straight on through to hit uh, the very simple uh, homes of people on the foreshore and, and then rips on in. The mangroves, I'm not saying there wouldn't have been damage from the typhoon, but it would have been a buffer. Yeah. And if you take out that buffer, then, of course, it can have catastrophic consequences. So, <clears throat> on the consequences, uh, mm. can we talk tourism for a minute? Mm. So, one of our alternative industries, uh, from our over-reliance on perhaps primary product export, has been tourism. We've always said, oh, well, tourism will rescue us. Mm. There are huge risks in tourism. How, mm. how do you see New Zealand positioned as an economy at the moment, particularly with our emphasis on long-haul tourism? Well, I, th I think there's several parts to that, that story uh, because th there's quite a movement against air travel in high-value markets in, in mm. Europe. You know, and so people are questioning whether they should fly 12,000 miles. So we'd better have a good story. Mm. And uh, you know, Air New Zealand has recognised, long recognised this and, and has a sustainable development strategy, was the first airline to do a, a long haul flight with a, with a biofuel, uh, for, for example. It, you know, we're probably not stargazing to say that the green hydrogen powered uh, flight is within reach, right? So whatever's in reach with sustainable fuel, we, we, we need to be uh, uh, grasping, uh, grasping that. But I think also uh, we need to be thinking about whether we're living up to 100% pure as an image, uh, because again, as the focus increases on how are things produced, uh, you know, at what cost to environment, including climate, uh, that yeah, starts to feed into an overall image. And I, th I think we can live up to the image of 100% pure, but, but we have some work to, work to do. Now, I think uh, tourism also at the moment is uh, not living up uh, to the aspirations that we had for it when I was PM, which was to emphasise again value and yield over volume. Mm. Uh, I saw a very interesting article in, I think, North and South, just in quite recent times, about uh, the debate now around tourism in New Zealand. Do we have too many tourists? Well, you know, th there are issues, and I think we, we need to be looking uh, at how we emphasise value. We have unique things here, and we shouldn't undersell them. Mm. Uh, so looking at, at yield, the, the return to New Zealand, uh, of, of, of tourism. I think you know, there's quite a lot of work to be done in that. And of course, a lot of it has to be done uh, by the industry, but government uh, can facilitate, it can lead, it can you know, support the industry to move 
in a, in a certain direction. I think that's a very important conversation to be had. So shortly we're going to be hearing from some, um, some young leaders with their own questions, but I was wanting to just ask you a couple of questions specifically about leadership and about being a young woman growing up. I mean, now when you look at the situation, and UNDP supported a lot of youth leadership internationally, but what do you think are the key things that help young leaders flourish, especially at the moment when we have this major problem mm -hmm. that our electoral systems are mm -hmm. basically weighted quite heavily to an older generation who votes? Mm -hmm. So what does it take to really support young voices and leaders? I think... What youth have now as a tool, which was never available when I was um, in that age group, is social media. Mm -hmm. It's so much easier to connect. Look at how Greta's Friday climate strikes mm -hmm. have taken off with the high school students around the world. It's quite phenomenal. Uh, I first heard of Greta in January when I, I was in Davos for the annual World Economic Forum. And I ran into uh, Christiana Figueres, who used to be the, the uh, head of the uh, UN's Climate Change Convention Secretariat. And she said, oh, come along to the main square. She said, the students are on strike. Greta's here. I thought, well, who's Greta? You know? <laughs> well, it, within a week, I wasn't asking who's Greta because Greta was everywhere and, and inspiring young people. So I, I would say to, to young people, you know, use social media to connect for advocacy, uh, but I think also the organisation now of, of concern and advocacy around climate, it needs to now transcend the school strikes and it needs to go into community action and advocacy. Uh, it needs to go into young people themselves seeking elected office. Uh, and I'd be interested to know how many have stood up for community boards and councils uh, yeah. uh, this time around. At UNDP, we had a very active um, youth policy unit, and they ran um, campaigns around, you know, no decisions about us without us, uh, aimed at, at young people. And so I think participation needs to go beyond activity in NGOs. It needs to go beyond voting. It needs to go to actually standing and asserting a, a point of view and, you know, hopefully being elected to to take those views into decision-making circles. I think also at the level of our councils, uh, very important to have uh, a way of youth being organised to, to input into council mm -hmm. and, and the, the council's affairs. But you know, my message to young people is don't hang back. It's your future. You know, be concerned yeah. about it. Be inspired by Greta and all those who are yeah. you know, out there uh, leading. Be leaders yourselves. Don't wait for others to inspire you. So would you support lowering the voting age? Well, my, my view on that is that the internationally recognised age of the child mm. is up to, you know, 17. 18 is recognised as the adult age. So I don't, I don't advocate dropping it. But nor does that mean that if you're under 18, <laughs> you shouldn't be advocating using ways of connecting and, and, and being involved. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, Kind of my last question before maybe we bring the panel up is, we always say New Zealand's too small. You know, lots of the criticism, oh, we're so small. Recently on social media, you got huge uh, take up for putting the map of New Zealand across <laughs> Europe. Had people in their own apoplectic fit looking at how big we were. I mean, it is, and the Pacific would say this too, that we're not people of small atolls, we're explorers of vast oceans. You know, how do you change a narrative when when it's, oh, we're too small to make a difference. Our, our contribution is tiny. Well, that map mania was incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I looked, that tweet had, I don't know, something Thousands. about 880,000 impressions. <laughs> and I picked it up off the Facebook side of the New Zealand Embassy in Ireland. They, <laughs> they thought, oh, let's, tweet, let's post about this map. So I put up a tweet about it saying, people think we're small, but really we're not. And it generated the most incredible. Uh, response, um, but yeah, I mean we're we're a significant land area uh, with a with a small population, but I'll say this about New Zealand. In my experience internationally, it has a good name, right? Nobody dislikes New Zealand. Everybody 
actually has quite an idealised version of New Zealand. Um, <laughs> so let's not dispel illusions here. <laughs> and, you know, when I was in the States and people would say, where are you from? Because they can never pick the accent. And you say, New Zealand. And every time someone will respond, oh, I've always wanted to go there. <laughs> so I'd say, well, why haven't you? And then they say, oh, it's so far away. I say, really? And I say, well, would you think anything of flying to Los Angeles? Oh, no. No, it's you know, four and a half, five hours away. I said, well, you know what? I said, you fly to Los Angeles in the late afternoon. You transfer terminals. You get on the flight. You have a dinner and a glass of wine. You go to sleep. You wake up. You have breakfast. And there you are in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> I should have been put on a commission, really, for all that. <laughs> All the advocacy. And with I hydrogen planes. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, our, our, our image is great. And, you know, at, at the UN, uh, New Zealand, one way or other, usually ended up on the right side of the ledger, right? It, its mm. voice was listened to. Had a tremendous, um, tremendous vote for the Security Council when we, when we ran for that, as we do every, every 30 years, uh, and did well on it. So... Mm. Yeah, our, our voice counts. Let us not think that what small states say and do has no impact. And you look at the international media in New Zealand is getting now. I mean, Jacinda is a global sensation. And uh, for, for, for the right reasons, actually. She's seen as, a you know, obviously a role model for women because there's so few women leaders around the world. She's, she's broken, you know, new barriers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think... You know, Jenny Shipley and I broke a lot of barriers in getting to that position in the in the nineties. But Jacinda doing it as as a young woman, uh, becoming a young mother. You know, this is extremely interesting to people, and and the issue of of gender equality in New Zealand is a, is of great interest globally. And then Jacinda's response to the shocking tragedies at the mosques in Christchurch got international commendation. Uh, for New Zealand, you know, concern and, and the inclusion tone that was set from the top. So what we say and do, how we conduct ourselves is of international importance. Well, you've certainly had an impact yourself, yeah. and um, it's now time to open up the discussion to a panel of young city leaders. Mm. And I can assure you to the audience, as they're fumbling their way up in the dark, <laughs> that if you are listening to this discussion and thinking, I haven't really, like I am, you know, what have I done with my life? It's now going to get much worse. <laughs> because I would like to introduce you to some people who have packed an extraordinary amount into a very short time. Uh, so, on our right, or oh, your left, um, can I introduce Satri and uh, Ravachandrian? Uh, Satri, Sati is a sixth year student at the University of Canterbury in a double degree in law and arts, political science, I just did, uh, and maths. Uh, but he's here today as president of the Student Volunteer Army. Um, Mia Sutherland is a veteran of the school strikes at 17. Uh, if it's not enough to be organising the school strike climate movement, both nationally and locally, she's also on the UN Youth Movement and she's on the Christchurch Youth City Council and in her spare time when she's not at school, she writes a fortnightly column for Stuff on climate change. And just here next to Helen is Lucy Gray. Now, Lucy is 12. Let me repeat that. Lucy is 12 years old. Mm. And uh, she founded the Christchurch uh, school strike movement uh, as a student from Beckenham. And she's co-convener now for the national uh, school mm. strike team. And not to be outdone, but a lot older now, uh, Josiah Tuolamali is Josiah, when he was 14, set up the Pacific Youth <coughs> Leadership Transformation Council, which has become an incredible force for leading new youth uh, and giving people an opportunity for voice. He recently won the Prime Minister's Prize for Pacific Youth Leadership. But tonight, he is being the uh, moderator taking your text messages. If you are texting in your questions, they're going to Josiah. Uh, he doesn't, he's just gonna be choosing randomly. They're being sent up. Um, so, please type clearly. <laughs> but what we might do is kick off with 
a couple of questions from the panel. Go to some um, text questions. Come back to the panel again. Does that? And we'll round them up. Mm -hmm. So, Lucy, it's yours to start. Kick <laughs> us off. Um, so, Helen Clark, um, what do you think would be the benefits of the government declaring a climate emergency? I think it would signal the seriousness of the climate crisis. And there's, there's international media now that uh, don't talk about climate change anymore. They talk about the climate crisis. crisis. Mm. And, and it is a crisis uh, because at the current level of commitments that the world's nations are making, we are heading for a three to, to four degree temperature rise. And that uh, is quite catastrophic. Uh, so it needs a lot more uh, political will at the national level. Look, believe me, I know it's tough to do yeah. this. I remember when I was PM, there was a survey once that, that said, asked New Zealanders, do you think the government should be doing something about climate change? And of course, in New Zealand, we always think the government should be doing something. <laughs> so something like 87% said the government should be doing something. So then they go through the questions and eventually it says, would you be prepared to pay more for a litre of petrol? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no one wanted to do that, right? And, as, and remember, you reminded me of the carbon tax yes. and the, the tractor myrtle driven up the main yeah. steps of parliament by a member of parliament. I mean, it's not easy to lead on these issues, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's got to be done. You see the trouble that President Macron got into with the proposed diesel tax rise. Although I think... If you're going to put on uh, new eco taxes, you need to relieve the tax burden somewhere else and or specifically mitigate for the impacts on the poorest people. Because uh, often people will say, well, you know, but that's the only way I can get to work is to drive, drive my car. And if public transport is poor, that may well be, that may well be true. But anyway, I, I think the, the crisis is, is real uh, and, Antonio Guterres had a very good line talking about his climate summit in New York at the end of next month when he said, I don't want the leaders to come with a speech, I want them to come with their commitments, right? And that's what should happen. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, Sati and Mia, can we, can, mm. do you want to ask one each? Can we put a couple to you so that we can, I can mm. see the texts that are going off there. So. <laughs> Right, kia ora, Helen. Um, at the Student Volunteer Army, we've seen how when disaster strikes, when tragedy happens, there's a really, there's the immediate reaction from people is this desire to take direct action. My question is how can we inspire that desire for direct action regarding the Sustainable Development Goals? How can you get youth and students really caring to go out and immediately act on them? Um, especially the other limbs, not just the climate, not just the, but the economic and the social limbs in particular. Yeah, do you want to respond straight away or should we? Yeah, no, I think, I think that there's a good point here because you know, when there's a disaster, you do get people, they want to help, right? They, they want to respond. And it's, it, we saw it happen at the local level here in, in, in Christchurch, both with the, the murders at the mosques and, and the, the horrors of the, of the earthquake in 2011. You see it globally, you know, you, major disaster natural disaster, people, people come rushing in. But actually, on top of that, we need huge investment in doing the things that will make communities more resilient and more sustainable. And that's long-term hard yards, right? Um, and not everyone's up for that. So in a sense, the, the, the humanitarian response needs to be converted into, and how could we stop that happening again? And what would we need to support? Who would we need to support? What do we need authorities to do? What can we do? So I think, you know, sort of youth moving into that mode of thinking is, is very, very important. Mm. Yeah. Um, so mine's a little bit similar, but I'll try and make it different. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, all the youth on this panel do some sort of influencing. Mm -hmm. They they try and take something and teach other people about it. And you do similar things. Mm -hmm. So how have you felt, uh, what have you found to be the most effective way to do this? Influence people. Yeah. Well, I have found that 
often you'll get the best response uh, with a positive story. So we can use the terms like climate crisis and climate awareness, but I think what really hits home is a story about this is what this community is doing about it, right? Uh, this is the action that they're taking uh, to become more resilient, to adapt to climate change, and this is the kind of thing that, that needs support. Uh, and, you know, clearly I've been sort of globally focused on, on how to do that and the need for support for the Green Climate Fund and the Global Environment Facility and, and longer term uh, development, but the, the same issues uh, apply here. Josiah, can we take a couple of questions from yeah. the text? And as you're just looking them up, it's a shout out to Sylvia Barnett, who's somewhere here tweeting for us under mm. chit chit conversations. We thought it should be chit chit chat, but we lost that. <laughs> <laughs> well, fantastic. Um, the first one we've got from Sarah How can we best support women in leadership, especially our young women? And a special thank you again, Helen. Mm. And then we've also got one from Regan What is the biggest leadership challenge we'll encounter in the public sector in the next five years? And how can we position ourselves to tackle this? Mm. Well, we, we could devote a whole evening to women in leadership, and Leanne and I did have a whole evening on women in leadership at the Theatre Royal uh, last year. Uh, but it, I think women have to have confidence in themselves, that they have as much to offer as any other gender. Uh, because often we are the worst <laughs> we are the worst at having confidence in ourselves, and it, it's sometimes said that a, a, a man will say that he's one hundred and twenty percent ready for a job <laughs> um, when he's sixty percent ready and, and uh, and women who are one hundred and twenty percent ready will say, "Oh no, not me, no, I couldn't do this you know I mean I think you know many of us sitting here as women we've all kind of had that voice in us, oh no, we couldn't do, do that. that. We can do it. So I think self-belief, uh, building esteem, uh, having good networks of support, which will be women and men, women and men, um, and also networking among women leaders and colleagues, I think is, is very important. But you know, w we have to uh, sort of build the strength in ourselves to, to step forward. And, you know, there is still a lot of residual misogyny, including in our own country, uh, that women have to battle through. Uh, if you think, you know, for two minutes of some of the criticism Jacinda gets, it would not be levelled at a man. Uh, in the first place, would a male PM be juggling with a small baby and putting in every hour that is, is given to work? And to see Jacinda labelled as a part-time PM when she probably works 25 hours a day is ridiculous. Uh, but I think there's misogyny under it. Mm. Um, so that you know, so, so you know, women need need support, regardless of never, whether or not you vote for a particular woman. You know, never never be party to putting women down. down. I think is, is is important. Now. The other Alexis. issue is what's the biggest leadership challenge that's going to face the, the, the public sector? Well, I mean, it, it, it would be easy to say, um, you know, the, the whole climate challenge, but I, I think we, we do have strategies and, and we can do it. So uh, let me throw in another one, uh, and that is, you know, this, this fourth industrial revolution and the impact on the world of work of what's coming down the track with the digital economy, uh, artificial intelligence, and the rest of it. And I, I don't know whether a New Zealand government has specifically developed a strategy for this, uh, but if we don't want a whole lot more people left behind and excluded, a great deal of thought needs to be given to the economy of the future, what skills it's going to need, uh, how we combine uh, social security and part-time work to give you know, everybody a, a decent minimum uh, standard of living. I mean, I, I'm not a, a scaremonger about this because every previous industrial revolution has had people saying, where will the jobs come from? But the reality is that where the jobs will come from will probably require quite a level of skill, which puts emphasis back on education, uh, flexibility, 
lateral thinking, problem solving. Uh, you know, I think, yeah, this, this really needs a, a concerted strategy for New Zealand. I was just thinking between what you've mm. seen and what mm. Lucy will see, it's quite a massive span of um, technology. You, yeah, technology. And you were you were just working out in the green room. We were saying you were two when uh, you were prime minister. <laughs> so, but now is your chance that, to ask the questions that you couldn't ask when you were two, but you could now. So, what's an, have you got something else you'd like to ask, Lucy? Bad actions, or I think, yeah. Well, I was, um, do you think there's any powerful actions or one or two powerful actions that people could do in their own lives um, after this? So um, instead of going home and feeling inspired and then doing nothing, <laughs> going home and feeling inspired and doing something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember when we released an energy efficiency strategy way back around 2006, six seven. one of the components of it was, you know, all the things you could do <laughs> to, to be more sustainable, like you know, turning off the power plug at the wall and not leaving the, the, the TV on standby all the time. And, and uh, yeah, there, there are dozens of little things that anyone can do. You know, did you need to drive the car around the corner? Yeah. Uh, could you have worked? Uh, you know, could, could you, you know, be more sustainable in your transport in general or your energy use or whatever? Do you compost rather than, you know, how much rubbish do you send out of the house every week, which, you know, could have, could have been avoided uh, by not buying heavily packaged stuff and, and, and having to dispose of it. So I, I think that you know, many small steps add up to very, very large transformations and that every individual can make those steps. Mm. Having recently given up the car, I can tell even though it's a flat city, it's quite full on biking. <laughs> but it's good for you. But uh, Sata, you were talking about transformations, economic and environmental. Do you want to chip in with a question here and we'll... Yeah, um, just based on your experiences with New Zealand's political systems and bureaucratic systems, what are the particular challenges we actually face in getting the sustainable development goals at the forefront of decision making? Having a sustainable development goals sort of code that we work to, what's stopping us there? Well, in a way nothing's stopping us, it, it just hasn't been done. Uh, in 2015, uh, John Key came up to the Sustainable Development Goals uh, Summit where they were agreed. Uh, so, you know, in principle, uh, across the political spectrum, people, people are for it. But then I think uh, probably Treasury's living standards framework and now the wellbeing budget, which is a good thing, they've sort of taken a pride of place. But I think... It wouldn't take a lot of effort for New Zealand to convert the range of strategies it has into you know, being aligned with the sustainable development goals and then setting out to, to measure uh, progress against them. Uh, I'll give you an example of a, a country that, that does this, and that's Germany. Uh, Germany has been producing sustainable development strategies since 2002 when there was the World Conference on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg, and they're on their third iteration now, their third edition of this. And the third edition is specifically aligned with the SDGs, and they haven't uh, taken uh, every goal and every target and, and measured against all of them. They've taken a range of goals, and they've picked targets that they think are particularly relevant to their situation. Uh, and then they're accounting for that. The reason I, I'm across this is because they also, with each new strategy, ask for an international peer review, and I chaired their international peer review. And uh, we, we commented on where we thought they were succeeding and, and where they could perhaps make some changes. But for a, you know, a good, honest effort, you, you can't fault the, the way that Germany is approaching this. So there are good examples out there from developed uh, countries like ours that we could you know, learn from and adapt from. Mia, do you want to chip in here? Yeah. Um, so in doing what we do, 
we often get quite a lot of criticism. Mm. So I was wondering how you dealt with that and you kept on doing what you do with passion. Especially, you meaning on social media as well? Yeah. It's a really big thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially you are so. young women on social media. Mm. I suppose mm. it's the downside of, mm. of how immediate it is. Yeah, how do you deal with that? Good question. Well, uh, I've always taken the view that if you're in the public eye, criticism is part of the territory, right? Uh, and the best bit of advice I ever got in politics was from Bob Tizard, Judith's father, who was the deputy leader of the Labour Party and deputy prime minister at one time. And he said, you've got to realise, Helen, that, <laughs> you know, he said in an, electro in an election, it's, it's a rare MP who gets over 50% of the vote. You know, usually you win your constituency with under 50%. So that means more than half didn't vote for you. <laughs> so keep it in perspective. Um, and, and that's the reality. Now, of course, a lot of that half, you know, will, will be people who give you a fair go anyway, and you, you meet them at the, the, the bowling club and the, the school committee and everything else that you do, and, and people are, are courteous and, and, and polite. Uh, but there's an element that just want to have a go. So I think the trick always is to work out uh, what criticism just goes with the territory, uh, but what might, might have a point and, and take that on board. Uh, but with social media, it, it has given rise to a, you know, this very unpleasant phenomenon of trolling, and there are some truly unpleasant people out there. <laughs> And my advice uh, to everyone, and particularly young people who can feel quite vulnerable and hurt if they've never experienced this before and haven't developed the skin of a rhinoceros like my, I have myself. <laughs> um, but you don't have to ever hear from these people again. You know, you have a mute function. You can block them and they'll go on and on and on about being blocked. But if you mute them, like, they will never show up in your feed. Uh, now... <laughs> Yeah. So <laughs> they're, they're, they're kind of shouting away to something that's not receiving them. So th this is this is quite satisfying. <laughs> uh, so I, I do quite a, quite a lot of that because uh, <laughs> uh, I found there are still some Helen haters out there. You know? <laughs> but uh, it actually, it reminds me of another story about uh, the late Sir Robert Muldoon. Uh, and uh, he one day apparently said to his secretary, whoever the name was, I don't think you're showing me all the mail. And she <laughs> said, what do you mean, Sir Robert? <laughs> and he said, well, there must be more critical mail. Because <laughs> he knew it was a polarising figure. And uh, she apparently said, oh, Sir Robert, I, I couldn't possibly show you the terrible things that people are writing. <laughs> He said, Miss, whoever, I want to see all the mail. And the, the apocryphal story goes that after she put it on the desk, he was heard cackling away at the desk. <laughs> <laughs> so as I say, it kind of goes with the territory. But, but no, you, you don't enjoy reading it. But it, 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 it's there. But we haven't got the mute button on the questions. So do you, so do you want to give us a couple more questions from yeah. the floor? Um, from Adriana, do you think if people knew they would live forever, they would have a different attitude to climate change or they'd act differently? And the second one from Hamish and many others, do you think there should be more civics education in primary and secondary schools? Well, I mean, some, some might act differently. You know, it, it, I, think, I think it would depend on the level of, of awareness. Uh, as, as to whether people are registering that, that climate change is going to impact on the way we, we live, basically. Are we going to you know, be radically affected? Believe me, if you're in a seaside settlement in New Zealand, you are. Um, you know, if you're in an area vulnerable to landslide, you will be. Uh, if you're farming and you need a predictable climate, well, I think you're already affected. You know, when I, I mean, I grew up in the Waikato, which was always green. The drought was almost unheard of, not, not these days. So I think if you're aware of, of what is happening and the consequences, uh, then you know, that's the first step to being prepared to not only yourself take certain steps, but to support those in authority who are seeing what's happening and, and the need for, for a response. Uh, what was the second one? About 
um, school civics education? Civics. Um, well, I think back to, <laughs> I mean, I, I think back to my school days. I mean, there was no civics education. Um, and you still ended up prime minister. <laughs> still ended up prime minister. No, but but I think there should have been. Yeah. I, I think that uh, we should have had some some basic knowledge about our society and uh, and our political system. And that that used to be a feature of American education that civics was always in the curriculum because they taught about their constitution, the role of the presidency, and the court, Supreme Court, and the Congress. Uh, I mean, I, I honestly don't know to what extent the curriculum's changed, but I don't hear, you know, family talking about it changing to the extent that these things are are, are included. And yeah, I think they should be. Mm. Well, we can just open it up actually, because we decided yeah. to give you more time, but we thought mm. it would be Helen said, you know, mm. why don't we just have more of a conversation? So, mm. do you want to hop in with any questions, anybody, and mm. then we'll come back to some from the floor? Mm. Um, we were talking about this a little bit in the green room, but how do we, um, in regards to New Zealand's carbon emissions mainly being with agriculture, how do we work to mitigate those without making farmers the enemy? Mm -hmm. Well, before coming tonight, I just a little check on where New Zealand ranks in greenhouse gas emissions. And of all developed countries, we are the fifth biggest emitter of all developed countries. If we take it of all countries in the world, we are the 21st biggest emitter. Mm. So let us not say <laughs> we, <laughs> we don't have an issue. Uh, we have an issue. And yes, 50% uh, is coming off, um, off agriculture. Uh, so when we say zero emissions, we don't mean no emissions. We mean you know, that we, we balance out. So clearly, there's a lot we can do in the other areas of, of emissions to start with. And as I say, you know, totally renewable energy ongoing without thermal as a backup is possible for New Zealand. We need a very deliberate strategy to get there. Uh, similarly, we can do a lot on, on the waste side, we can do a lot on transport and, and movement. Uh, obviously, if you deal with the energy generation issue, then you, you're going to be dealing with with industry and and its uh, its emissions, so I think that's all that's all good. Now, on the agricultural side, New Zealand has for a number of years been uh, active in a consortium that was is uh, working on research on the methane emissions uh, out of out of agriculture. And the New Zealand farmer has always been very quick to pick up science and technological innovation. So I think you know if we can get research breakthroughs on what can be done uh, to reduce methane, uh, whether it's uh, through animal breeding and physiology, th whether it's through nutrition, uh, also less intensive farming, but more uh, focused on value, uh, put that in again. Uh, there are the uh, nitrification inhibitors, uh, which uh, can help deal with the nitrous oxide emissions. So it, it, it's very important not to label agriculture and farmers as the enemy, but to say, look, we, we've got a common challenge here, and and how can we, you know, work across all these these lines to try and deal with it? It, it is doable. Mm -hmm. I think we need to take a very positive attitude to this. Just before we um, go to a couple of questions from the floor, can I ask a question, really, um, we, Lucy and I have talked about how anxious kids feel about climate, and you have dealt with some pretty heavy situations um, in the UNDP work. We've talked about some of the great things, but you've also had to deal with a lot of very difficult things, and I know Mary Robertson, um, Robinson talked when she took over in her international role of, of how she coped with big worries. Like, or, or, so from your perspective, what helps? Well, I think what always helps is knowing that, uh, firstly, these are shared challenges, right? A lot of people are working for solutions, and there are solutions. Uh, you know, we, we have to be incredibly positive uh, uh, about that. Uh, the solutions lie in science and technology 
and an attitudinal change and behavioral change. But it is possible. So, you know, I always take a, a, a very positive attitude to, uh, to, what, to what can be achieved. We're not powerless here. And I think, uh, you know, po possibly a downside of talking about emergency and crisis is people think, oh, it's, it's just too much, there's nothing I can do. Always come back to what can you do? What, what are the steps that you could take? Because empowerment and what they often call in, in jargon, agency, a sense I can do something, there's something I can, can, can do that will make a positive difference. Yeah. Mm. I can see just now. Oh, do you want to ask a question, oh, Lucy? I'll just quickly jump in, if that's okay. Um, I was just wondering, because um, what you were saying leaded kind of um, onto my question about how do you suggest that we go about um, on a large scale changing people's mindset about climate anxiety or about um, just the way they live their life in general, whether it be um, whether it be spending, whether it be um, their car, just changing their mindset to um, be able to kind of see what impact their um, choices are going to have. Well, some people will get it anyway, but of course there's also a role for public policy mm. and law and regulation, and that's what your city's faced with when it designs its, you know, its, its transport system, its, uh, its how it enforces its building codes, its, uh, you know, there's, uh, so also the way you price things, uh, in effect environmental taxes will have, um, have an impact one way or the other. So yeah, it's, it's a mixture of the individuals who get it and the others for whom, you know, regulation and policy will kind of direct Push choices it. as it were. Yeah. But I mean, let's face it, you can get a pretty extraordinary reaction to that. I remember you know, one, of the, one of the issues that got, uh, we were pilloried on towards the end of our term of government was there, there were a lot of suggestions for how you could, uh, at a household level, uh, contribute to using less energy. And uh, you know, this got beaten up into, you know, she's going to tell you how hot you can have your shower. Well. Uh, <laughs> please, <laughs> yeah. you know, but but you know there are things that can be done in the way you use use your energy. So, mm. Mm. and probably your work in, a, in at an emotional level too, mm. Lucy, is making a big difference. Shift, mm. making people think about it not just as a technical yeah. question. But Josiah, I see you scrolling through questions. So do you want to fire a few at us? Yeah. So um, Jason, drawing on your example, Lucy asks, what advice would twelve-year-old you, Helen, give to yourself now? And what advice would you give to your 12-year-old self? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think um, my, when I was 12, I, I would never have imagined that I could be prime minister, right? I mean, prime ministers were all elderly men when I was a child. <laughs> uh, so if I were a 12-year-old now, I would know it was possible for a girl to become Prime Minister. And I think that's been you know, the great change in, in our country to see women at, at the top of everything, really. The only thing we haven't cracked is the police and the armed forces. <laughs> 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 but uh, you know, everything else, a woman head of the SIS at the moment, that's, yeah. uh, and a woman I think was acting at GCSB at some point too. Yes. But anyway, so, so girls have done it all. So I think you know, retrospectively you'd say, have confidence in your ability to do whatever you set out to, to do, you, you can do it. And there's the role models now for, to make that real, which there weren't when I was a child growing up in the, the 50s and 60s. Mm. Taking it to the international, Andrea was wondering, how effective do you think institutions like the UN are enabling meaningful change in community? Mm. Well, I think... Uh, I, I actually must post the lecture that I gave oh, yes. at Grant Robertson's request a couple of Mondays ago. He has an annual Peter Fraser lecture. And Peter Fraser, of course, also one of our longest serving prime ministers who was uh, one of the, the founding parents of the UN. He was at the San Francisco conference in 1945 when the charter was negotiated. 
And uh, so any UN theme is very relevant to a Peter Fraser lecture. So I said to Grant, oh, maybe I'll give the lecture the title, Multilateralism, Time for a Revamp. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of uh, went through uh, where, where the UN had succeeded and, and wasn't uh, doing, doing so well. And you know, the reality is that since World War II, we haven't had another world war. We haven't had the major powers at war. And that was a, you know, a huge uh, uh, objective of those who drew up the charter, to stop another world war. Mm. Uh, but unfortunately now, uh, we have so many protracted conflicts, ghastly conflicts going on, and the greatest number of forcibly displaced people ever. And the humanitarian community struggles to respond uh, to this. And the UN hasn't really worked out how to, if you like, have a positive impact on this new generation of conflicts, which are largely uh, civil wars, non-state actors, terrorist groups, they're proxy wars, you know, one side's backing this, one side's backing the other. So that's um, not an area of great success at the moment. But uh, there's a very good series called um, uh, the UN uh, Intellectual history of the UN. And it looks at you know, great ideas that came out of the UN, and without doubt, human rights. Mm. Right? Eleanor Roosevelt, we say thank you for <laughs> leading uh, the negotiation of the Universal Declaration. Gender equality, the UN has given uh, credit for having put on the agenda and, and really pushed for. And then the Millennium Development Goals, out of which have come the Sustainable Development Goals. I think the trick is to take these agendas down to the community level. And that's why I stress the importance of, well, you know, youth action, uh, community level action, city level action. Uh, you don't have to wait for governments to lead at the, mm. the national level. There are things you can do. And when the sustainable development goals were being sort of thought about, at UNDP, we hosted a sort of sustainable development goal hub for the UN agencies. And through that, we did sort of a major global survey, which got millions of responses, asking people to list what their priorities were to get involvement. And then uh, we worked with the other agencies on national consultations, which were mostly held in developing countries. Uh, but we always insist on a very wide cross-section of society being, being involved uh, to uh, get a national discussion and debate going. So, yes, there, there are many ways of taking these big agendas and boiling them down to what could I do in my community, what could I do in my city or district, what could my country be doing, and keeping uh, what we call civil society engaged, and youth's a very important part of that. Well, actually, I was going to ask Sati and Mia about some of the examples that you've seen that work well, but I see you're holding Deed and Proceed. Do you want to... Yeah. Thinking well, about local things... Well, thinking that... about innovation, and Kiwi innovation, it was uh, wonderful this afternoon uh, to uh, meet uh, Bridget Williams, who's behind Bead and Proceed. Is Bridget here anywhere? Um, maybe? Anyway, Lockdown. what, what uh, <laughs> Bead and Proceed does is... Oh, this is... Where are you? Do you have your necklace on? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, 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 right. See this necklace. <laughs> um, so the necklace has got five big beads. And what Bead and Proceed does to promote the SDGs is it has these kit sets, and they've got a whole lot of little sustainably produced wooden round objects, uh, which become beads, and a painting kit. And people uh, work together to work out which of the sustainable development goals they most value and everybody's got a different priority. Some might choose cities, some might choose gender, some might choose X, Y, Z. Uh, and then to choose the color of that goal and paint the bead accordingly and get a conversation around that. And it's designed to raise awareness uh, of, the, uh, of the sustainable development goals and get people thinking about it. So it's a really lovely project. I put something up on the Facebook page with a website on it today and Instagram. But, you know, a great... Uh, Kiwi innovation, and there's the, um, the picture of the kits with the balls and the paints and the brushes and, and the rest of it. So um, a shout out to Bead and Proceed, conceived right here in Christchurch. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So just before we flip to a couple more questions and as we're coming to wrap it, this is your chance to promote a couple of the things that are happening. Lucy, I know that you want to say something about the thing, events coming up. Um, yeah, so um, me, you might want to chime in after this. Um, on the 27th of March, School Strike for Climate, Christchurch is having an intergenerational strike. Oh, September. Um, yes, yeah, September 27th. Um, intergenerational meaning that climate change is everyone's responsibility. Everyone's, um, it's everyone's problem essentially and everyone needs to work together to solve it and we need everyone's voices. So that's, I suppose, the theme, the theme of the strike. Um, so we're aiming to get everyone. Um, we want youth and we want um, people, we want minorities, but we want everyone. Aunties. Yeah. <laughs> Uncles, right. Grandparents. Yeah, we, Professors. Yeah, we need everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Me, Excellent. Other projects that you've really been involved with or want to give a shout out to just before we flip to some last couple of questions? Sati, I saw, yeah, SBA yeah. all out recently. Yeah, so we're all, um, the Student Volunteer Army is still very engaged in our local community, doing a lot of things that correspond very directly with the, sustain with the Sustainable Development Goals, whether it's working in the environment um, and doing, you know, planting and restorations, or actually going out and helping people in their community spaces, bringing together people and working on wellness and everything like that. I do have one thing I really want to push, which I, is a really awesome local initiative I saw. Um, there's a guy, Bariz Shah, at the University of Canterbury, um, who's doing something to help sustainable development over in Afghanistan, um, where he is fundraising $20,000 to help support 51 um, micro-businesses in Afghanistan, give people, 51 individuals in Afghanistan, the chance to make their own livelihood, build their own sustainable um, business. And so if you want to go check that out and contribute to that, that is on, um, I think it's on Give A Little, and you can, yeah, contribute meaningfully towards sustainable development somewhere else um, and help someone else as well. And that's 51 people in Afghanistan to help um, to remember the 51 people who were lost in March 15 as well. So that's a really awesome local initiative. Yeah, add anything at night? No. Um, so quick disclaimer first, I'm here on behalf of School Strike for Climate, not the Christchurch Youth Council. <laughs> Is Kate here? No. No? no. Okay, then here? I'm safe. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, the Christchurch Youth Council is really great because we do a lot on a lot of different issues and it's a really great thing to get involved with if you're young when I got involved with it, I didn't really see myself as a leader or someone who had skills that I could really put to use in that sort of environment. I just wanted to see how I could get involved. So it's definitely somewhere really good to start if you're looking to become more involved in your community. And um, I'm pretty sure registrations are in November. Yeah. Mm, so yeah, any, I'm 12 to 24 years old got general members, anyone can be a part of it. Um, yeah, it's a really good thing to get involved with and you get to hang out with me, so. It's <laughs> <laughs> all good. Mm. Mm. So, um, Josiah, I think we've got time to take two more from the, from the floor and then we'll wrap. Perfect, so the final two are from Tony and Charlotte and we'll go to Tony's one first. How can traditional Māori knowledge be shared to instill a more caring society? Mm. Well, I think encouraging that feeling of, of whānau, uh, which is extended, right? I think in Pākehā society, we often have quite a small definition of, of family, but that, that broader concept of, of family and, uh, and being in, in it together and supporting and helping each other is, is extremely important. And I think that's a, a kaupapa that needs to, to run through our, our social services and our health services and our schools. So. We should draw on the very rich indigenous tradition that, that our country is privileged to have in that respect. Mm -hmm. And the second one from Charlotte, um, what is your current roles? <laughs> what are you focusing on at the moment? How many hours have we got? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've always found that when one door closes, mm. several others open. <laughs> um, so when when I decided that, you know, obviously I, I shouldn't continue after an election loss to, to be party leader, uh, I had in my mind, what, what will I do next? And uh, the opportunity to, 
you know, be appointed as UNDP administrator came along, and, and I did two full terms at that. Uh, but that, that is the expected length of service, mm. and in any case, having been uh, a contender for the Secretary General job, I would not have felt it appropriate to stay longer than that in, in any case. Uh, so I obviously announced that I was going uh, uh, several months before the end of the second term, and I had no particular idea what I'd, I'd do except travel the Trans-Siberian Railway, which I did. Um, but the, actually, the phone never stopped ringing. And uh, probably I've taken on too much. <laughs> but I uh, have relatively recently taken on chairing uh, two quite significant international partnerships. It's, it's what I call a new form of multilateralism, really, because multilateralism at the UN is very much about member states. But there are much broader organisations, and one of them is the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which was set up in the early 2000s and aims at driving transparency and sort of anti-corruption measures uh, in countries where there are extractive industries. And extractive industries are often a curse if they're associated with, with conflict, think blood diamonds, or outright theft of, of, of resources and misappropriation of money. You know, if you, if you think of Angola, uh, which has been very, very, very oil rich, the richest woman in Africa was the daughter of the last president who chaired the National Oil Company. Well, you know, <laughs> quite lucrative, really. Uh, but, you know, the initiative uh, exists to, to try and address these issues and encourage countries which have significant oil, gas and minerals to come in and then to live up to a standard, which is like a convention. It's a formal standard. So I've taken over chairing that, and it's a tripartite organisation. Uh, it has governments, developed and developing. It has the major Western extractive companies. It'd be nice to get those from developing countries in as well. Mm -hmm. And it has civil society, uh, global and uh, at the local and, and national level. Uh, so that, that's a bit of work. And I've also taken on chairing <laughs> the... Um, <laughs> actually quite complicated. There's some very difficult cases, but <laughs> that's another, another conversation. Uh, it's also taken over chairing the, the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health, which is really a wonderful um, partnership across 10 constituencies. <laughs> there's governments, there's obviously civil society, NGOs, there's health professionals, the International Council of Midwives is very active, and Sally Pearman, uh, well known in the midwife community here, is. Uh, uh, was at the, the meeting I was at in The Hague uh, recently. Uh, there's other international organisations represented. Uh, the private sector's there. Uh, just you know, a big partnership. And its focus is, what can we do to advocate for action on maternal, newborn and child health? So that's uh, as someone who now has a sort of growing family of great nieces and nephews. I'm very focused on child health at the moment. Mm. Um, so there's that. I chair UNESCO's uh, advisory board for the Global Education Monitoring Report, which is an annual report and is monitoring progress against the SDG on, on education. Uh, and by the way, you know, the so Sustainable Development Goal on Education has a target of by 2030, every child aged 6 to 17 being able to enjoy 12 years uh, education. Uh, the prediction on current trends is that one in six will not achieve that, which is clearly not good news, so that needs a lot of action. Uh, I've been involved with, well, I'm also <coughs> co-chair of an advisory board for a public fund, largely funded at this point by the Norwegian government, which is looking at new ways of trying to combat tropical forest uh, deforestation. Uh, through concessional lending uh, on a triple bottom line accounting kind of um, basis. Uh, I sit on a commission, or co-chair a commission, currently preparing a major report uh, that will be published in The Lancet on repositioning uh, child health and well-being in the sustainable development agenda because 
you know, for maternal and child health, the sustainable development goals are a bit of a challenge because they don't have the explicit focus that the Millennium Development Goals had. With Millennium Development Goals, you had a whole goal dedicated to child health. You had a whole goal uh, dedicated to women's health and sexual and reproductive health, and that, that's not there now. So you have to struggle for visibility for these, uh, for these uh, agendas. Um, and then I, you know, I, I'm obviously asked to speak a lot at um, international meetings. So I chair other bits and pieces, and but I, I'm <laughs> actually <laughs> quite quite heavily involved. Uh, and the and um, the Helen Clark Foundation. And oh yes, the, the, Helen, <laughs> the Helen Clark Foundation, and we. Uh, well, I'm the patron, so I don't direct it, you know. But it's it's, it's of course uh, trying to encourage public debate and bring international evidence to it. We've already published on green hydrogen. Uh, that was the first paper. A very interesting paper on social media and how a democratic society deals with the online harm issues, which are, this is obviously extremely important in the Christchurch context because the man who carried out the killings, he was able to be part of a very nasty community online, which operated under the radar. Uh, but there's also the uh, excessive harm caused through bullying. When I was in the UK earlier in the year before Christchurch, the big harm that was being talked about was uh, the bullying on Instagram, which led a teenager to take her own life. So there's a lot of concern about this. So we've published on this. And now the foundation has been selected to present a paper uh, and a project on this at the Paris Peace Forum in November, which is very exciting. Uh, so we're working on that at the moment. And then, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'll just mention one last area. I became a member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy, yes. which consists of a number of former heads of government and, and heads of state, presidents and PMs, and some other eminent personalities. And uh, we are campaigning for drug law reform. So obviously I'm very happy with the Misuse of Drugs Amendment Act that went uh, through. And I will be advocating the yes case on the legalization of cannabis on the grounds that uh, over 80% of New Zealanders uh, use cannabis in their lifetime. None of us wants to be in jail for that. We don't want to see our kids there. At the moment, it's totally arbitrary whether you're picked up or not. Uh, the application of the law is extremely discriminatory against Māori, uh, which should be a major concern right through our prison and, and justice uh, system. Uh, and in addition, I feel that uh, if you can legalise and regulate, then you're in a position to put out good public health information, because none of these things are risk-free. It so happens that it is less risky than tobacco or alcohol, uh, but it has health issues. So that we need to be upfront about those. And if you regulate, then you can regulate as in Switzerland, where people can buy cannabis in the local store, but it's very low on THC and high on CBD. Mm. So you can regulate content, you can have a, an, an age limit, um, you need to stop it becoming another big alcohol or big tobacco, mm. which is you know, always a headache. Uh, with those those industries, but I think you know we're better to deal with reality rather than think that prohibition works. Because if 80% of people have used it, it doesn't work. Huh? <laughs> well, that's probably a very good time. <laughs> With that enormous list, the other reality is that we have to get Helen to another event. <laughs> so uh, I would like to thank um, Helen, but the words are going to come from our mayor. And as Leanne's coming up, I do want to thank the panel as well. It's been fantastic, Sati Mayor, Sire Lucy. Um, thank you. Thank you, Bronwyn and Helen, for leading what I would call a courageous conversation. And uh, I was reminded recently that the word courageous comes from the same root as the word for heart. And a courageous conversation is a conversation that you have with your whole heart. And that's what we've had from you tonight, a wholehearted mm. commitment Thank to you. the issues that matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I, w- I was going to thank Helen, um, only she took me back in time <laughs> to some unfortunate memories. Um, <laughs> But the one that I just wanted to pick up on, because it is in relation to the power of social media and the influence uh, that it can have, and not for the good, I'm sorry, but for, for the opposite of the good, but to, to actually advance interests that are not disclosed, the anonymity, uh, the, the trolls, um, but also the artificial intelligence that sits behind bots yeah. that actually send messages very deliberately targeted to people to affect the way that they feel, the way that they think, and the way that they uh, mm. contribute, even the way they vote. So mm. It's, mm. It, it is a serious, serious issue. But I just re- it just reminds me of the power of campaigns. And you talked about Myrtle, the, the, the tractor, tractor, going up the stairs of Parliament. Uh, I recall that one, and even the person who drove it up there. But um, <laughs> Driven but by Shane Ardern, no it relation. Was, <laughs> I was deeply offended, as were so many others, when a constructive conversation was being held with the farming community about the need for pricing carbon and the absolute importance of doing so. And behind the scenes, while they were talking very pleasantly to us, uh, they were concocting the fart tax, uh, which was um, not only, you know, sort of, uh, sort of frustratingly um, annoying because people latched onto it, but it was anatomically incorrect, and I found that deeply and personally um, offensive on every level. But it, I, I, re- I say this to you just to remind you of the power of um, of those influencing campaigns that sometimes you don't see what the intention actually is. And sometimes there is a need to take some political steps, you know, at central government level over some of the issues that our young people are thinking about really seriously. And instead of complaining that nanny state is going to tell you how hot your shower should be or how long you should be in it or whatever, you know, we really do need to confront those issues head on and say it's okay, we actually want to do this and we want to make a difference uh, to the nation and that's what we've heard from the young people. So thank you Bronwyn, thank you Helen, a special thank you to Josiah, to Sati, to Mia and Lucy for joining the stage Mm. this evening. Thank you for asking hard questions, they are important questions, keep asking them but more importantly, contribute to providing the answers because you are part of the solution. I look at you, I have no doubt that our future is in safe hands. Good leadership and well done each and every one of you. And you... You, the audi- all, the, all our partners for tonight's event, but particularly you, the audience, for your participation. I hope you've been inspired and challenged. I hope you believe that Christchurch can make a unique contribution to debating all of these issues. I hope you leave optimistic and inspired to take individual action, but actually, more importantly, to take collective action and collective responsibility and our young people are leading the way in that regard, and that tonight's conversation and influence continues beyond the event. The video of tonight's conversation will be available online shortly. I encourage you to share it and keep talking. And now I'll hand over to Corbyn to close the evening. Throughout the discussion tonight, there was a whakatoki that came to mind. Nāku uh, te te kete mā tauranga, nāu te kete mā tauranga, ka para hia te ara ki te pai tawhiti. Uh, with your basket of knowledge and my basket of knowledge, a pathway to the future can be carved. Mm. Um, and I think that kind of sums up a little bit of uh, the discussion that we've had here tonight. Uh, again, on behalf of Ngai Tua Hudiri, thank you for coming along tonight. Uh, and all the best uh, to wherever you're off to uh, next, Helen. Uh, and on that note, we'll quickly end with the karakia. Unuhia, unuhia, te pau, te pau, kia wātia, kia wātia, ai, kua wātia, turu turu o, fiti whakamaua, kia tīna, haumie, huie, tāeki e. Tēnā koutou. Okay.